Back before my wife and I married, we went out for a couple of years. Then, with no reason, she wanted to see other people, and maybe get back together later. I was destroyed, and I threw myself into my work instead. A year later, the guy she traded me with cheated on her, and they broke up. She contacted me, but I refused to talk with her. She went back to him, and they stayed together for a couple more months, and he cheated again. This time, they parted for good, and she attempted to contact me yet again. And for a second time, I refused to speak to her. She had wounded me deeply, and I couldn't forget it. She went on to another guy, and they were together for six months or so before he began to become pretty physical with her, leaving bruises. Unfortunately, I went to a party and ended up hammered, and she and I somehow ended up back together. I'm not saying all was as it was before, far from it. I still loved her, but I have to admit, I didn't trust her totally, with good reason it seems. We dated for over a year after which we got married and she moved in with me. My house was free and clear. My grandparents had given it to me as a gift when I graduated from college. It was small, but it was a rental of theirs and out of the way, about 10 miles from town on a dusty old road. It was perfect for me. We both decided to wait for at least three years before we start having kids. Our marriage was perfect for the first two years and I could have sworn we were fine. Then it happened again. Instead of leaving me though, she brought in someone else. Without my approval, which I'm sure she knew. It was Valentine's Day and I got off work after a half day, bought flowers and a nice card and headed on home to find a car I knew sitting there. I knew it because it was the same car her old boyfriend she dropped me for drove. I parked a distance from my house and walked the rest of the way. The front door was locked, understandably, and I went around to the back where we had a key hidden and went in the back door. Through the kitchen and down the hall I went after making sure no one was in the living room, and I heard them before I opened the door, the springs squeaking and the moans. I opened the door just enough to look in and make sure it was my wife. Hey, anything can happen and I needed to see with my own eyes. Yep, there she was, on her back under the covers with Tom between her legs and the covers moved up and down with him pounding my wife. My beautiful young wife, lean and so full of love for someone else. It never dawned on me to harm them. I wanted her gone from my life. To see her offer everything that was mine to someone else was painful beyond what I could imagine. I had to break up the party and walked in. Annie saw me first and shrieked, pulling the covers over her face. Tom jumped out of bed as he began to pull his clothes on. I just watched quietly. The room was silent except for the sobs coming from under the covers. When he finished dressing, he looked at me, hoping I'd get out of the way. But I continued to block the doorway even though he was substantially larger than me. Then I broke the silence. I asked if he isn't forgetting something. He looked around in confusion and back to me. I looked at him like he was an idiot and said, take her with you. Get her up and dressed, and the two of you get out of here. Immediately I said that, she started screaming. By the time it was over, I made him drag her from bed, forcibly put the clothes on she'd already worn that day, and he dragged her from the house screaming at the top of her lungs. Tom had moved back to town to his parents, and I told him over the next few days I would be dropping her stuff off at his house. Throughout all of this, he never uttered a word. Outside of being a well-known man-whore, he was a likable guy. Unfortunately for my wife, a little too likable. I could see him forcibly holding her in the car as they drove away. True to my word, I dumped off everything of hers I could find in Tom's yard. No one came out and I didn't knock on the door, I just threw it out. It wasn't until a few days later, I found out she wouldn't go to his place, he took her home to her parents about 60 miles away. She had been calling the home phone and my phone so often, I'd finally unplugged the house phone and changed the number on my phone. I had nothing to say to her. A few days after I dropped her stuff off at Tom's place, her parents drove to my house. 
Annie was in the car too, but I told her dad when he came to the door that if she got out of that car, they all needed to leave. He told her to stay, where I could see her begin crying again. Then both parents came in. First, they apologized for her, but I told them it wasn't their fault. Then they wanted to know what they could do to make it better, to help us get around it. By their reaction to my answer, I guessed it never entered their mind. I told them there was nothing they could do, and that Annie was damaged goods and I had no desire to have her back in my life. She cheated on me in my bed and we're done. I told them all this in a calm, even voice, yet a very firm voice, leaving little opportunity for argument. Then I told them everything from back when we were first going out and how she had acted earlier. That surprised them both. Sue, Annie's mom, tried to explain how devastated Annie was. That got a snort out of me, and I told them she wasn't nearly as devastated as me. She got fucked, but I was not only fucked, I lost the woman I'd planned on having children with, raise them, and grow old with our grandchildren around. Throughout this, I was crying, and so were both of them. But I let them know it wasn't something to be fixed. Annie needed to move on and find someone else. And I mentioned Tom's name, which earned me a dirty look. Sue let me know Annie swore she would never even look at Tom again, let alone take him as her man. Of course I told them it's too late. She'd already taken Tom. She'd chosen him over me, and that was that. When they left, they made me promise I would stay in phone contact with them. They were worried about Annie and how hard she was taking the whole thing. That just made me shake my head in disappointment and muttered how hard this was for her. I think it was the next week, George, Annie's dad, called and asked if I would talk to Annie, but I refused. Apparently, she hadn't eaten since I booted her, or at least very little. She wasn't a big girl, and as lean as she was, there was little weight she had to lose. George and Sue both begged me, something that was more painful for me to hear than them to do it. It was their baby, and they were concerned she might do something harmful to herself. I had her served the next week. In the papers I'd had drawn up, we each took out of the marriage what we brought in, which was very little. But I offered half our saving, which was substantial for two dumpsters, almost $30,000, from before we were married too. When George called me again, he was sobbing as hard as Annie was when Tom dragged her from my house. He asked if I would put it on hold, give us both a chance to cool off. He said Sue and Annie both were even more devastated and Annie had begun throwing up the instant she was served and still hadn't eaten. They ended up calling an ambulance, and she was admitted to the hospital after we hung up. I left town. Yep, I just left. Quit my job, gave the power of my attorney to my folks to make all my decisions, and also rent out my home. Then I left. The first year was spent in Alaska, working on a fishing boat. During that time, I contacted no one. The second year, I was working on another fishing boat out of California catching tuna. The next three years were spent in Alaska in Prudhoe Bay, working in the oil fields. In five years, spending no money, banking it all, I made a huge sum of money, made bigger yet by investing wisely, something my Prudhoe Bay employer made available to us all. Not that I was filthy rich, but I had enough money to retire on, if only a small stipend was taken out each year. If I were to live on $50,000 per year, I would still be increasing my investments, not taking it all away. I also had part interest in a couple oil wells, three natural gas wells, and half a small fleet of tuna boats. The yearly income on the wells alone was okay. We had an accident in Prudhoe that made me question my mortality and I ended up quitting and returning back to my town. My folks were shocked when I showed up on their doorstep one evening. Our conversations had been limited. I didn't want to be reminded what I had lost. But my homecoming was fantastic and the next morning, they had called all our family and a big party was planned for the next afternoon, a Saturday. They caught me up on Annie. After I left, she had to be hospitalized for quite some time. She refused to eat and finally slit her wrists, trying to off herself. 
after a few tests, they found out why. She was pregnant. George and Sue contacted my folks, hoping to get in touch with me and to let me know I was going to be a father, ostensibly to force a reconciliation. My dad, however, after letting him know they couldn't get in contact with me, that I had left town, asked George as nicely as possible for a grandparent DNA test. As happy as George was, he agreed. After the birth, when it was safe enough, they did the test and it came back that I was not the father. George and Sue were nearly catatonic over the results. I did find out I was divorced though. Annie refused to take half the money and it was still sitting in the bank. After the baby was born, he had a full head of black hair exactly like Tom. He manned up and married Annie after finding out he was a father. They had been married almost four years and had two more kids. They lived in his own house and he was making a decent living. Annie stayed at home with the kids and the few times my folks saw her, she seemed happy enough. At the party, I was shocked to see George and Sue stop by. They had been invited by my folks and wanted to see me. I had a nice talk with them both. They said Annie was happy enough with her kids, but not so much with Tom. He still stepped out on her. He just couldn't keep it in his pants and had brought home a few surprises for her. It sounded as if she wasn't going to leave Tom over it. After all, just like I had told her folks, she was damaged goods and who else would take her? They were both happy to hear how well I'd done while gone, although I didn't tell them I was by our standards rich, not wealthy, just very well off. They were sad and both admitted they wished they were still my in-laws. I saw Annie one day when I was sitting at a local deli, having a sandwich and drink while doing business online. She had her three kids with her and looked shocked when I looked up and we made eye contact. I wasn't angry anymore. I had put it behind me. She walked up to me, much akin to a deer that is about to run, and when I didn't bite, took the seat I offered. We had a good talk, but when she tried to explain and apologize, I told her no way. I didn't want to hear it. She tried a couple more times until I threatened to get up and leave. After that, we had a nice lunch I bought for her. Her kids were nice and I had the oldest a boy sitting on my knee by the time it was over. At one point, she looked at Timmy sitting on my knee and began to cry, telling me he should have been my boy and this should have been our life together. I just smiled and told her I had always dreamed the same thing. At my words, she got up, grabbed her kids and diaper bag, and damn near ran out the door. It was a funny thing. A year later I was married. Who did I marry? The tenant living in my house. My folks asked me to go over and talk with her moving out, and we kind of hit it off. I ended up leaving her there. She was a college student, and my folks had made the rent low enough so she could afford it and really had nowhere else to go. We began to go out and after a few months, we knew it was true love. I didn't ask for a prenup. Perhaps I should have, but I didn't. You see, Janny didn't know she was marrying a well-to-do man. I wasn't the wealthiest, but I wasn't broke either. I had things going on for me financially. She thought I was just going from job to job across the country and didn't have anything to show for it. Hell, I was living at home with my parents. After we'd been married a few months and I still wasn't looking for a job, she finally came to me with a worried look, wondering if I was planning on it. Her biggest concern was that I might leave for a long-term job, leaving her alone for long periods of time. I really had fun when I sat her down and began explaining I'd put a little money away I was planning we could live on. Of course, she was worried about what we'd do when it ran out. She had her teaching certificate but hadn't found a job nearby, although she found we're going to have us moving quite a distance. The look on her face was priceless when I took a piece of paper, wrote a number on it, and then turned it over face down. She hadn't seen what it was and asked what I was doing. After I told her, it was how much was in my checking account, and I thought it might get us by for a while. She tentatively asked if she could see it. I hemmed and hawed, acting like I was worried. Then I slid it over 
and she slowly turned it over, looking up at me in surprise. She was excited to know I had such amount in my checking account. Although our house was small, at least we didn't have a house payment, and even though I didn't have a car or truck yet, her little car was paid for. We went out to celebrate the worry that she felt lifted from her shoulders. A week later, she was waiting when I came in from where I had been working in the garden out back after she called for me. She had checked the account and asked me to contact the bank, saying someone had made a mistake and had deposited some money in our account. When I chuckled, she looked puzzled. When I told her it was an automatic deposit since it was the first day of the month, she seemed even more puzzled. She left me and went for a walk, saying she needed to be alone. When she got back, she found me back in the garden and sat down. She watched for a bit, and I finally sat back and took a good look at her. I could tell shock was still in open display. That evening, we went out to dinner. We had just our sit when I saw Tom, Annie, and their kids across the room. Both had seen us. I didn't know if they knew I was married. This was the first time I'd been out with Janny that I'd seen either one. Janny looked when I mentioned them, but that was all. She ignored them after that. She knew who my ex was from photos and knew the story, but this was the first time she'd seen Annie and had a name put to her. Our town wasn't big, but neither of us were much on going out, preferring to be alone for the most part. Before our food came, Janny stood and excused herself to the restroom, and it wasn't until our food came that I realized Annie wasn't sitting with her family. That worried me. Jenny wouldn't do anything, but I guess she wanted to meet the ex. Jenny never said anything but looked a little smug when she returned. I glanced over and saw Annie sit down with her family, and it looked like she'd been crying. In only a few minutes, they had paid their bill and Tom gave me a dark look when they passed us to leave. Tears were still running down Annie's face, when she walked by without acknowledging me. Jenny confessed to seeing Annie leave for the restroom and couldn't resist going in and having a talk. After introducing herself, she just told Annie she would never know what she'd thrown away. Anything else that was said wasn't shared, and I didn't care to hear it anyway. Annie was my past, Jenny was my future. Over the next few years, we welcomed our two beautiful children, a boy and a girl. And while we lived in the same house, Jenny drove the same car and was working at the local high school finally, while I drove my same used Chevy pickup I'd bought. Things were good for us and we lived peacefully. Even during the summers, we stayed at home to take care of our little house. We have little need for much more. And as for Annie and Tom, well, let's just say revenge is best served by living well. <laughs>